you, the morning chair, Scott Tannis from Alberta. Good morning, everybody. Karen Sorensen, Alberta, Treaty 7 Territory. Mary Coyle, Antigonish, Nova Scotia, Mi'kma'ki. Thank you, Senators. Today we are continuing the series of briefings meant to inform and guide the future work of this committee. Before I proceed, I want to note that the content of this meeting relates to Indian residential schools, which for some may be distressing. There is support available for anyone requiring assistance at all times, free of charge, via the National Residential School Crisis Line at 1-866-925-4419 and Hope for Wellness at 1-800-721-0066 or at www.hopeforwellness.ca. So now I want to give you some background about today. You may recall last March, the Committee on Indigenous Peoples heard from the National Center for Truth and Reconciliation and the Office of the Independent Special Interlocutor for Missing Children and unmarked graves and burial sites associated with Indian residential schools regarding their respective work. Based on this testimony, on July 19th, this committee issued an interim report entitled Honoring the Children Who Never Came Home, Truth, Education and Reconciliation. One of the recommendations made in this interim report included a commitment to hold a public hearing with governments, churches, and church entities, and others who continue to withhold records about residential schools and associated sites. During this morning's meeting, we will continue to hear from these witnesses. I would now like to introduce our witnesses. From the Archdiocese of Ki Watin Le Pav, Archbishop Murray Shatlin, Shetlin, and from the Oblate General Archives, Father Bill Shore Abram Jerome, General Archivist, OMI, and Father Warren Brown, Representative of the OMI General Administration. Well, Alan, thank you for joining us today. Now, witnesses will provide opening remarks of approximately five minutes, which will be followed by a question and answer session with uh, the Senators. I uh, will now invite Archbishop Murray Shatlane to give his opening remarks. Uh, good morning, uh, dear members of the Senate Committee. Thank you for your invitation to address you today. I've been serving as Archbishop of Kuwait and La Paz since 2013. Uh, this past August 29th, I was invited to go to Cross Lake, Manitoba, one of the communities we serve. And I was able to walk through the old residential school grounds and cemeteries and look firsthand at the unmarked graves. Father Joe Cabral and I prayed with Kimberly Murray Sandy Robinson and some of the other people of the community. It brought home to me even more strongly the need to support our families and learning as much of the history as possible and to be able to let rest in peace the children that did not make it home from residential schools. We will continue to collaborate with bands and families as we work at reconciliation over this painful part of our history. Examples of work the Canadian Conference of Catholic Bishops has undertaken to support healing and reconciliation journey in response to the TRC calls to action. Uh, one is a national apology from the bishops of Canada for the role the Catholic entities played in residential school system. The creation of the Indigenous Reconciliation Fund, an independent charity funded by 73 Catholic entities that is on track to raise 30 million over five years overseen by an Indigenous Board of Directors. Embracing the United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples and identifying an opportunities to accompany Indigenous Peoples in the pursuit of justice, healing, and reconciliation. Supporting Catholic institutions, seminaries, and religious communities to foster greater understanding of Indigenous cultural, linguistic, and spiritual traditions and values collaboration with the Government of Canada, the Vatican, the Assembly of First Nations, the Métis Nation of Canada, and the Inuit Taparit Kanatami to plan for a historic delegation to the Vatican, which has occurred, as well as the Holy Father's uh, pilgrimage to Canada. Working with the Vatican to support the formal repudiation of the ideas associated with the doctrine of discovery, and the work continues there. The Archdiocese of Kuwait and La Pa submitted a copy of all archival files relating to residential schools to the NCTR beginning in 2013. And these were what we believe completely submitted by April the 2nd, 2014. 
In 2021, a member of our Archdiocesan staff found a box of files that contained some residential school lists. The box was in a different area of our archives. Um, it just involves this amount. I brought a copy of that's the size of it. Um, we uh, immediately contacted NCTR and met with them in October 2021, where we agreed to have the files digitized and passed on to them following their required procedures. We sent the copies to the St. Boniface Historical Society, and they were digitized. Unfortunately, although I thought they had been passed on to the NCTR at that time, the files had not been submitted. On October 3rd, 2023, we met again with Raymond Fronier and other staff of the NCTR to discuss how to complete this task. At this time, the, uh, well, uh, Chris Zast uh, did go November 3rd to the archives, and just yesterday he finished the uh, uh, formation of the metadata sheet. So all the files from that uh, group are now at uh, the NCTR. We're also looking at developing a memorandum of agreement between the NCTR and our archdiocese to access some of our sacramental records or other areas of our archives that could be helpful. We will continue to work with the NCTR while following guidelines for historical sacramental and death burial records. Sacramental registers are some of the church's most precious records in the sacred trust. They hold vital records of personal and civil importance and so must be maintained in accordance with the privacy provisions under both federal and provincial civil law. I've read the reports that have been presented on these issues and I thank Kimberly Murray NCTR, and all of you senators as well for the work of helping our families in this important area of grieving. Thank you. Thank Any you, questions? Archbishop Jatlane. I will now invite Father Jerome to give his opening remarks. Honorable Chairperson and committee members, good morning to you all. I thank you sincerely for this opportunity to appear virtually today. I'm Father Belichor Abernam Jerome, General Archivist of the General House in Rome. I present myself together with Father Warren Brown, who in September 2022 completed 12 years as a member of the General Administration representing the oblates of the Canada United States region. I will begin my remarks by recounting our work with the National Center for Truth and Reconciliation, NCTR, which was facilitated by Father Ken Thorson, the provincial superior of the Ablet province of Oyemai Lakom. In March 2022, Father Ken Thorson indicated that Mr. Raymond Frogner, the head of archives at the NCTR, planned to visit the Ablet General House archives in Rome to review any relevant documentation to his research on residential school history. This was within the agreement between OMI Lacombe province and the, the NCTR, and our Superior General wanted us to be fully transparent and cooperate to the full extent that the laws of the church, country, and the European Union permit. As you may know, European Union privacy laws have strict uh, protections on access to personal data. The OMA General Administration want, wanted to be in solidarity with the affected persons, to commit themselves to justice and peace for them, and to work with other concerned parties for truth and reconciliation. Mr. Frogner arrived in Rome on 3rd July 2022 accompanied by Mr. Rob Mayer, the Chief Administrative Officer for the Oble Province of Oemai, Lacombe, Canada. The General House Archives in Rome is a small private collection. However, our Superior General gave special permission for Mr. Frogner to have full access to the whole archives on the Canada mission, which is approximately 75.5 linear feet. Mr. Frogner identified some photos and documents related to the residential schools in Canada to be sent to NCTR in digital form. 
most of the general archive photos are part of a very informal collection along with photos from other oblate units without any description. The members of the general administration who visited Canada from Rome would have brought these photos or they might have been sent to the superior general for information about the congregation's missionary work. Mr. Frogner had a list of some oblates who worked in residential schools. I provided him with the oblates uh, personal files. These files generally contain the birth baptism confirmation certificates, certification of making vows and receiving holy orders, diaconate, priesthood ordination with assessment reports. And the letters from their individual oblates, superiors to him and about him. Mr. Faulkner made notes and he expressed his satisfaction with his findings. We were also told that when he returned to Canada, he visited the archives in Richelieu and he or his colleagues visited the Centre Patrimoine and the RBCM to view the corresponding oblate files to validate his process of analysis. As the archivist, I was satisfied with the visit and invited him back as part of our transparency to the NCTR and the indigenous communities. He said that he would send us a list of documents on his return to be dig digitalized and sent to NCTR. A new, new leadership team for the Oblast took office in October 2022 and the new superior general pledged to continue supporting the truth and reconciliation efforts of the Canadian oblates with the indigenous peoples and gave me permission to begin the work of digitalization. The identified photos and documents in the list given by Mr. Frogner have now been scanned and sent to the Oblate Richelieu archives to have metadata included as required by the, by the NCTR for search capabilities. And the Richelieu is working with the NCTR on sending test files for quality and search capability. Towards the work of truth and reconciliation, the OMI General Administration is committed to collaborate, participate, and share any information with NCTR in accordance with the European Union's established privacy, privacy rules for personal data. I look forward to answering your questions. Thank you. Thank you, Father Jerome. We will now move on to questions from senators. And to help keep us on time and to ensure equity to all, each senator will have five minutes for a question and answer exchange. And if we will go to round two, if we have time. I'll now invite Senator Tannis to ask the first question, followed by Senator Sorensen. Uh, thank you very much, Chair, and uh, uh, thank you uh, uh, for being here. Um, I guess my question would be for um, the folks uh, uh, that um, are here on behalf of the Oblates. You mentioned it a few times uh, in your uh, in your um, uh, comments about the laws of Europe and and privacy and so on uh, being an issue. Um, can you can you expand on that a little bit more um, and tell us if, in your judgment, there are um, that that those laws prevent or provide an obstacle for the for for the transfer of valuable information uh, to the NCTR. Is there, you know, uh, do we have an obstacle that needs to be addressed that, you know, we could, we could do some research on to see what, you know, what uh, international work we could do uh, with our government to try and get the information? Um, can you comment on, on how big that issue is in your view? 
you, uh, Father. Okay, thank you. Um, thank you, Senator. Uh, our general administration at the very beginning um, asked me to consult uh, some lawyers. Actually, there is a person in, in our administration to deal with these legal issues. So he contacted the lawyer to find out where, whether there are any obstacles. But actually, when Mr. Frogner came and wanted um, some of these documents to be digitalized and sent, and we consulted our lawyer uh, whether there is any problem of sending these photos and files, but there was no problem. So we committed ourselves to continue with uh, digitalization. But actually, um, I do not know whether there are any issues, but so far we have come across, have not come across any issues related to that. But actually, each time we do any activities, we can do consultation uh, with the lawyer um, to see whether there are any laws preventing. But so far, we have not come across any difficulties with regard to uh, digitalization and sending these identified photos and documents. Thank you. Do I have time for another question? Yes, you do. So uh, with respect to uh, Archbishop uh, Chatelain, um, I think you said that uh, you found some additional information, some lists in 2021. Um, and um, you let the NCTR know. You sent them to a third party, um, and I and forgive me, I, I don't remember the name of, of where it went, but it had to go somewhere else to get, um, to get digitized, and they didn't send it on. You discovered this is somewhere uh, this fall, and as of yesterday, uh, those files are now in the hands of the NCTR. Is is that right? Yeah, that's right, uh, Senator. Great. And and uh, are you absolutely then satisfied that uh, you know, given that you you found something that uh, you you didn't think existed before and found it and and passed it along, are you now satisfied that you have found everything that there uh, that is that is uh, vital and relevant for the NCTR's work uh, and archives, in your archives? Uh, yeah, 99% was there already that we passed yeah. on eight years ago. So it was just this little bit. So we feel that everything is there. Maybe there's a little surprise, but we are absolutely not holding anything back. And uh, so if we find a little bit, we'll do exactly the same thing, but for sure, the vast, vast is there. Everything we know of. But if you find something, it won't take two years to get it in the NCT. No. <laughs> no. Okay, no. thank you. Thank you, Senator Tannis. Uh, Senator Sorensen? Uh, thank you, and uh, thank you, everybody, for attending today. I'm going to direct my question to start with uh, to uh, Archivist Jerome, but I'd be very curious um, for Archbish Archbishop Chatland to comment as well, and I do have another question after for the Archbishop. Um, the first question is, it seems to me uh, that former residential school staff and administrators are living archives who could have valuable information about the events that took place at these schools, including where sick or injured children may have been sent and what happened to the remains of students who died. I ask this uh, because we've heard from many that record holding organizations, uh, even with full access, uh, don't have the resources to sort through these records in a short period of time. And time is of the essence. Survivors and their family members are aging. And to put it bluntly, at the current rate, uh, people will continue to die before they find out the truth. So my question is around interviewing living people. Um, understanding personnel records can be touchy, but having face-to-face -face interviews with living people who may remember, for instance, where the school cemetery was located or what institutions children with TB may have been uh, transferred to might help these um, people get their answers more quickly. So in addition to making archives available, having living former staff members be interviewed to find out what they may know, is this something that is or can be pursued? Yeah, thank you, Senator. Um, on our behalf, uh, the OML administration uh, 
Um, actually, our archival policy says um, uh, the uh, private uh, personal files are allowed to have access only after the after 25 years of after the death of a person. But actually, when Mr. Frogner came, our Superior General gave uh, permission for full access. There was any issues. But actually, you, these particular type of your question, because these um, uh, interviewing people and all um, uh, living people, is depend on the unit provincial superiors in Canada, because they have the full uh, authority over it. I think Father Warren Brown uh, might help me in this regard, uh, Father. Yes, thank you, Senator. Yes, the um, archives in Rome and the records that we have are very uh, skeletal, as Father Jerome said, just a basic uh, data about each member and the, the vast majority of information is held in Canada and the Canadian uh, provinces and superiors have been working and are very open to, to doing this um, and to speaking with the personnel that worked in the residential schools. Thanks. Um, Archbishop Chatelain, do you have any comment on that being in Canada, if, if that is a process that's happening? Uh, thanks, uh, Senator Karen. I think it's a very good question that we do have some very elderly sisters and priests that uh, were working in some of these schools and, and lay staff as well. Um, there has been a little bit of interviewing, but I think we should uh, work on this sooner with a specific um, uh, questions, I think, you know, about particular communities, particular cemeteries. I think that could be helpful. Thank you. I, I just think there's a wealth of information still sitting in people's voices that uh, would be helpful. Do I have time for my second question? Uh, this is directed to you, Archbishop Shatling. Um, just to expand, I, I am interested. It's the first time I've heard about these fundraising efforts. So uh, the history I have was that in 2015, the government agreed to forever discharge Catholic entities from having to pay the rest of what they owed Indigenous communities under the Indian Residential School Settlement Agreement. As I understand it, the original settlement agreement required 48 Catholic entities to pay $79 million in three parts, including including an effort to raise $25 million, of which only $4 million was raised. However, I further understood, and to your point uh, in your uh, testimony today, I understand that many Catholic organizations, including Saskatchewan Catholic bishops, are continuing to raise money for reconciliation initiatives. Um, so I'm asking you, how is that uh, organized across Canada? Uh, has it been encouraged uh, by national groups like the Canadian Conference of Catholic uh, Bishops, or is it more localized? And can you give us a little bit more data on how much has been raised uh, to be donated, uh, how the funds are then dispersed, and um, how much has been dispersed? Yes, uh, Senator Karen, I'd love to pass on that information because I think it's important. Uh, so, I, I, you know, I think everybody was saddened by our lack of response on that. We we did contribute $29 million. We did over $25 million in in-kind service, but our fundraising was not successful at all. And so everybody was, uh, that was a, 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 a sticking point. So uh, about a couple of years ago, the Bishops of Canada agreed to uh, create this fund and to commit $30 million over five years towards this. So far, I got an update just a little while ago. Of Eleven million has been raised so far, and fifty projects have been supported already. Yeah. And the process that we have is that um, there is regional or diocesan um, assessment committees of projects that are uh, staffed by Indigenous people, so that they would have a, an Indigenous group that looks at the local requests. If they um, want to support them, then they're submitted to the National Committee. And the National Committee is made up of Indigenous peoples as well. And uh, then they grant uh, from this com this uh, fund uh, the, the funds that are, are they are supporting. Uh, thanks. And uh, much respect for making sure that it's Indigenous-led in terms of the disbursement and funds. Yeah. Thank you. That Thank was very important. Thank you, Sandra Sorensen. Okay, so I have a question, uh, and it is for the Oblate General Archives. Mr. Frogner located the personal records of at least 12 Oblate 
priests convicted of crimes against children forced to attend residential schools. However, he was unable to copy these records due to your privacy policy. Is that true? And if so, could you please describe your privacy policy regarding personnel records and what steps you are taking to make this information available? Thank you, President. Actually, um, uh, as far as I know, Mr. Frogner did not have any problem uh, with regard to uh, copying uh, the documents related to these identified persons. Um, I don't know whether there are any issues outside of our general archives, but at the general archives, we have not come across any such issues. Um, is that I, I'm, I don't know, I'm answering uh, your question. Father Warren Brown, if you can enlighten more about it. Uh. Father Brown? Yes, uh, Senator. This is the first that I have heard of this. Um, as far as we were un understood with Mr. Frogner, everything that uh, he had asked for, we had given, and uh, the records, he was very satisfied with uh, the visit, and we told him we're very happy to have him come back and make another visit if, if he would like. But I didn't hear that there was any records that were subject to privacy laws with the European Union or anything like that. Okay. Thank you. Thank you for that. Uh, Senator Coyle. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And thank you to our three witnesses who are here with us today. We, this is such an important matter, and uh, uh, we, we really do need your help in, in uh, getting answers and also where there's still action required, uh, encouraging you to take further action. Um, Archbishop Chatelain, my f first question is for you. I think I under I, I really actually appreciated uh, hearing, um, you know, the whole background on what the Canadian uh, Conference of Catholic Bishops has undertaken. You know, that, that was helpful. And then what has been done in the two stages, uh, including the most recent stage completed yesterday, uh, in terms of all records being handed over to the NCTR. You did, at the end of your uh, testimony, mention um, sacramental records. <laughs> Uh, and you also, in, this, in the same breath, mentioned privacy considerations relate, related probably to some of those or perhaps all of those sacramental records. And I can imagine that uh, baptism records, uh, communion, uh, possibly even confirmation, but in particular last rites um, or um, what used to be called extreme unction, I think it's called the anointing of the sick today, um, would be you know, those kinds of records held at the parish level, I believe, uh, would be, uh, could be important. Could you uh, fill us in a little bit more on uh, your thoughts on what might be in those records that could be helpful in the search for the truth um, in order for us to get to reconciliation and what barriers, if any, or um, ways of getting at that important information uh, could be. Mm. Thanks, uh, Senator Mary. The, I think this is an important one, and it, it's why we want to work with um, the NCTR on the sacramental records, because they are archivists, and so they understand some of the sensitivities. Uh, funeral records, I think, we're really open to sharing because they're pretty public already the information that's there with obituary notices and things. It does get more sensitive with baptism records and um, whose the parents are and things like that. And so uh, we have to be a little more cautious um, around there. But with someone like NCTR, a group that we can, they know how to redact the, uh, the records uh, to keep them in an appropriate way. That, uh, so we, we're hoping that some of that can be helpful for them. An example would be Cross Lake is trying to determine their uh, unmarked graves and the children that died while at residential schools. So there was a list that they had, and uh, the Oblate sisters who had worked there used um, 
the diaries of the sisters that they had in French, handwritten, and they took out all the names they could find of students that were mentioned anywhere in those diaries. Then we took our sacramental records and we crossed referenced them and some of the names were in ours and some weren't and and we had some that were new so that would be an example of us trying to use our sacramental records to help with the, the list forming so that would be an example of us trying to use our sacramental records to help with the, the list forming okay Thank you for that. Um, I'd like to, uh, I, I understand uh, the importance of place-based uh, research and, uh, and whatnot. Um, but I'd be curious whether there is a, any kind of a comprehensive effort underway, um, you know, really trying to link those sacramental records to, uh, you know, the big picture of what we're trying to find out, you know, who passed away, where did they pass away, where are they, where are they buried? So, so that's one question. And my second question is actually a follow-on to my colleague's absolutely important question of living archives. So we all think it's a great idea. My question on that is, so now what's going to be done? You know, n not just good idea, you know, maybe some ad hoc stuff could go on. Is there something more comprehensive that could happen to in a in a quick in a quick way? Is those people <laughs> who are living are 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 elderly, as as all of you have said, and we're aware. Um, so I'd like to hear about that as well, if possible. Uh, I, I think I would encourage uh, around the sacramental records that people continue to contact the local diocese um, that um, that that will the diocese can sort of I think uh, respond uh, uh, the, uh, as quick as possible um, with with that one to try to do a, a national kind of thing that's gonna take uh, that would be very challenging uh, the, the one about the living archives um, I would uh, think that if we could come up with you know, some basic questions we'd like to ask some of these priests or sisters that are living yet, uh, and that somebody, uh, you know, if we just have those basic questions and try to have an interview of them, uh, I think that's possible. And, um, but I don't know who should be leading that. Like you said, we can talk about it, but how do we, we lead that charge? Could that be under NCTR? Um, I don't know. Thank you. Thank you, Sander Coyle. And this is kind of a follow-up to uh, Sander Coyle's uh, question as well. Uh, and this is for Archbishop Chatelaine and Father Brown. Uh, did any of your personnel make statements regarding their role in residential schools to the Truth and Reconciliation Commission of Canada? And was participation in the TRC encouraged by your organizations? I can go first if sure. you want, Warren. Um, during the TRC, um, I was bishop in Yellowknife, so I was even further north, and so we did uh, really participate in the gathering in Inuvik, and all our staff was there, and we all uh, contributed there. I also participated in Saskatoon's um, uh, gathering and uh, Edmonton, uh, so we did, um, did evolve. We also made apologies. Uh, so that formal apologies were offered uh, at that time, too. Mm -hmm. Father Brown? Yes, thank you. Um, I'm aware that the Oblates did participate in these hearings, but I can't really tell you exactly the number, Or, but I, I do recall that they did speak quite often about participating in different settings in these meetings, and they certainly are fully open to continue um, to be sharing information. Thank you for that. Uh, Senator Patterson. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And uh, first of all, I'd like to thank uh, all of the witnesses for, for being here with us. Not everyone has been as forthcoming um, with requests to appear in this uh, important study our committee is doing. So I, I do thank you for, for being here. 
And I want to just say that um, uh, having lived in what is now Nunavut for a number of years, I've, I've met many oblate priests and known of them who, and they have done, you know, difficult service in remote locations that's often been very helpful to um, the lives of uh, mostly Inuit population. But um, there can be bad apples in every barrel, and uh, we've even experienced that in the Senate in the past. So I want to ask you about a difficult subject, and I think uh, it's Mr. Father Jerome that uh, I'm probably directing this question to, and that is that um, when we heard from the NCTR, Mr. Frogner uh, told us that he had a list of over a dozen oblate priests who were convicted of crimes against children forced to attend residential schools, and he located those personnel files in the Rome or archives, but was unable to copy the information due to the oblate's privacy policy. And he told us that he he understood the oblates uh, noted they may be they may enable access to these personnel records. So my question is whether the uh, practices of keeping personnel files sealed. I think it was originally uh, up to 50 years after the death of an oblate father or brother. Has uh, if there's a new policy on release of personnel uh, files now, and I guess in that connection, whether the NCTR has been now given access to requested personnel files. Thank you. Thank you, <clears throat> Senator. Actually, for the first time, I'm hearing today that uh, Mr. Frogner said that they couldn't have access to any particular files because um, when he came here, uh, whatever he asked, uh, I provided all those files. And at the end, uh, he expressed his satisfaction. And uh, on his return also, after his return, he sent, uh, sent a document, he issued a document saying that he was fully satisfied with uh, his visit to the General Archives Rome. Uh, as far as I know, I have not received any information saying that he couldn't have uh, access to any files and um, uh, for the first time I'm hearing about it. I don't know, maybe it, it would have happened outside of our general archives, I do not know. But at the general archives, um, so far I have not heard anything about it uh, from Mr. Frogner or from NCTR. Thank you. Um Okay, well, he w uh, my understanding was his information was about the Oblate's personal, personnel records. Um, but I'm wondering, uh, and you'd mentioned 25 years in your earlier testimony, what is the um, current um, policy on uh, the sealing of personnel files um, with respect to oblate fathers or brothers, please. As far as, so, thank you. As far as um, we are concerned uh, here, the archives in Rome, uh, even though we have this um, uh, uh, regulation, for the Superior General gave permission to be transparent. So, um, provided that uh, the Europe, law of the European Union permits, uh, we don't have any objection. Uh, but we have not come across any such difficulty so far. Okay, well, that's, that's good to know. Uh, one other uh, question, Mr. Chair, thank you. Um, I'm wondering if um, you could, I understand that um, the um, Archdiocese of Kuwait and La Pa um, has indicated on your website that you have at least one archive, one archivist, Father Shanta Gandamala, and I believe you're an archivist, uh, Father Jerome. I'm just wondering if uh, you could describe the, your archivist's work and the priorities 
as they relate to providing access to records for survivors and their families, please. Okay, for us, uh, we are a small office. We don't have a large staff. So Father Shandabala uh, has uh, several other jobs as well. And uh, so he, he he's helped by uh, my um, secretary and executive administrator, uh, Nicole, and uh, we have a volunteer as well. That's basically our archival work. So we had our archives in about 2007 um, transferred to St. Boniface Historical Society in Winnipeg because they have the or former archivists and uh, the uh, ability to maintain the the uh, health of the paper and and the uh, things of our records so those are are down there and so we've directed people um, uh, to to saint boniface also all our residential school records are with the nctr so we direct people to contact nctr as they've encouraged us uh, with some of these uh, requests if uh, people are coming to us directly, we do what we can as well to respond to individual requests or bans uh, from our area. So that's how we're trying to provide information as best we can. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Sandra Patterson. Uh, I'll ask a question now, and this is for, for all of you. Uh, what steps have your organizations taken to help combat residential school denialism among Catholics? I've seen firsthand how prevalent this is this issue is in church and know how important it is for governments and churches responsible for the Indian residential schools and other institutions to be transparent and accountable. I guess I I would say that um it, it is challenging to uh, sometimes address racism and uh, some of the things that are present in our church as well. Uh, but I have been pretty outspoken for many, many years about the history, and I've been blessed to uh, have personal friends who went to residential school. And so I'm able, through their permission, to share the stories. So I try to pass on the stories um, to some of the people to help them to understand maybe more deeply. And I always encourage them to talk with somebody who went to residential school. And, uh, you know, please talk with them and see what their experience was like here, here firsthand. So that's um, an ongoing um, uh, responsibility for us. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Archbishop Shatling. Uh, Father Brown? Yes, thank you. Um, the Oblates are an international congregation, and we cover um, more than uh, 65 countries. And when the uh, news arose about the, the finding of these um, graves, um, we took a very proactive stance as part of the general administration to inform the whole congregation what this issue means um, and the uh, seriousness that with way we we are facing it through the Canadian Oblates. At our chapter last year, um, Father Thorson and the other Canadian Oblates gave a presentation about the, the, the situation of the residential schools so that all of the congregation understands um, the steps that the Oblates are taking in truth and reconciliation process. Um, and I think that the, the members of our congregation facing many, um, many different justice issues around the world are very conscious of that and very supportive of the work that the Canadian Oblates are doing and that the whole congregation wants to do, especially with regard to this uh, situation. Thank you, Father Brown. Father Jerome, anything to add? No, you're on mute. I'm sorry, thank you. Father Warren uh, has been the member of the administration and Father Warren knows well the policy of the administration and of our congregation, so it's fine. Thank you. Uh, Archbishop Chatelain, you had your hand up? Uh, yeah, I just was thinking that, you know, one of the really, I think, powerful comments was that uh, Pope Francis came to Canada and that he sat in our Muscochis and in our areas and made a heartfelt apology. That, I think, is a real positive step 
one step to, in the works, and that all the bishops of Canada signed on to a formal apology. Uh, so when Catholics are saying this is, uh, you know, we say, well, the Pope and all the bishops have apologized because they think there's something we really need to apologize for. Bishop. Senator Tannis. I, I just uh, before we leave you, uh, and again, uh, much appreciate you taking the time to be with us. This, what appears to be misunderstanding between uh, what we heard from uh, from Mr. Frogner and what we've heard here today, um, do, you know, we've we've uh, inserted ourselves into this process in part out of sympathy for NCTR and their frustration over uh, over not being able to get certain things done or in some cases playing hide and seek with uh, with with other entities you've been very forthcoming here and we really appreciate it would you um, undertake that if we get some additional information clarification that is is uh, relevant and and uh, continues to maybe highlight that there is a misunderstanding would you undertake uh, to uh, to clear that up, provide the records that have been asked for and not received? Maybe it's another one of these uh, telephone issues where uh, the digitization didn't happen and it's sitting on somebody's desk. But we 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 will follow up, uh, and if there's something, we will get in touch with you and and uh, ask for your undertaking to clear uh, to clear the matter as you've said happened. Um, is, is, are you comfortable with that? Very. In fact, I'd encourage uh, that, um, whether it's NCTR or other groups, keep going back to the local bishop, keep going back to the local archivist, uh, that often we have an initial contact and then we don't hear for quite some time. So it, I think it's important that... Uh, yeah, Father that Jerome keep... Fa and Father Warren? Yeah, thank you. Actually... <clears throat> Actually, um, yeah. fathers, uh, our provincial superiors in Canada are dealing with this uh, directly. Um, uh, the files that Mr. Frogna identified here, the general archives, actually I, I, I took little time to um, digitalize and send because of the change of administration. But I have already handed over in uh, June uh, this year uh, to the Richelieu archives, but the Richelieu archives uh, recently, the last week, um, uh, sent me a message. They have already uh, analyzed these photos, digitalized photos, and sent two sets of uh, documents have been sent to NCTR very recently. And yesterday also I got an information, uh, the uh, um, uh, archivist of the Richelieu, uh, that um, they have analyzed certain documents and sent so so far but still they will be doing the other part of the uh, other sets of photos and documents That's other than that other than that i'm sorry maybe the our uh, superiors uh, provincial superiors in canada may deal with it um, father warren if you need to add anything that, that's very helpful, and, and Father Warren, if you could speak to the tw the twelve files specifically, uh, personnel files that uh, uh, Mr. Frogner uh, spoke to us about. Yes, uh, Senator. Yes, definitely, we would be uh, very willing to f to follow f follow up on this and find out exactly where this uh, miscommunication has happened, or if there's some as you said, message that we didn't receive, that we should have received. Uh, but yes, we certainly would, would want to follow up on this. It would be very open from the NCTR to communicate with us and to, to follow up on this. And as Father Jerome has mentioned, he invited Mr. Frogner to come back to our archives and we're very open for his return visit if he should choose to do so. Thank you. Thank you, Sandra Tannis. Uh, Sandra Coyle. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I'm wondering, uh, this is probably more a question for Archbishop Chatelain. Um, you're, well, you've, you've dealt with many different jurisdictions in Canada previously, and currently you're crossing different provincial borders where, where you, you, you are now. Uh, I'm wondering if, 
if there's been any issues relating to navigating uh, the different jurisdictional um, uh, frameworks um, that you've encountered in each of those provinces in terms of the recovery of records and transferring them. Is there is there anything we need to know about as we try to unpack this whole area of uh, record retrieval um, that that uh, you could share with us, uh, or maybe not? You know, maybe maybe the, there haven't been any you know issues there at the jurisdictional level. Yeah, I. I think that you know that that's a piece one is that um, sometimes there's different organizations that are asking for records for different reasons and uh, it's a little hard to navigate who's asking and for what purpose uh, so sometimes that that gets in uh, the mix um, uh, we, we we are trying to focus on being collaborative helping and uh, so whether it's in Saskatchewan or Manitoba we haven't really found um, uh, legislation that's hampered that. So good, great. M more, it's uh, trying to be sensitive of the privacy of families. Right. So. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Coyle. Uh, I've exhausted my list. If anyone else has a question, if not, okay. The time for this panel is complete. I wish to again thank our witnesses for joining us today and providing your testimony. And if you wish to make any subsequent submissions, please submit them by email to the clerk within seven days. And that brings us to the end of our meeting today. This meeting is now adjourned.